1, which is chapter 14 of Exodus, because in a moment Tim is going to come and preach God's word to us, and before that Sylvia Mount is going to read it for us. So you might want page 71 in the Blue Bibles. The children of Israelites, the Israelites are now in the uh, desert, having left Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and camp near Pi Hararoth, between Migdol and the sea. They are to camp by the sea, directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering through the land in confusion hemmed in by the desert, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of, Israel, of, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We've let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi Hararoth, opposite Bar Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. He said to Moses, was it because there are no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us, leave, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Then Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid, stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, so they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and it turned into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a well of water, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He made the wheels of their chariots come off, so they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Israel, Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians 
and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back in place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of those survived. Then the, Is the Israelites went through on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw that the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the great power of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses his servants. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood firm like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the, front, in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them, I will divide the spoils, I will gorge myself on them, I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them into your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall upon them. By the power of your arm, they will be still as a stone until your people pass by, O Lord, until the people you bought pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, your hands established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them. For the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much, Sylvia. If you could keep that Bible passage open, that would really help me. Again, thank you very much for welcoming you, me uh, back with you this morning. It's really a great joy uh, to be with you again. Uh, let's pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all that it teaches us about you and your greatness. Lord, as we look at this passage in Exodus this morning, we pray that you'd be helping us to love you more dearly, to follow you more closely, and to serve you with all our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I love a good film with an escape in it. Although I've got to confess, I've never seen The Great Escape, 
But one of my favourite films is a film called Escape from Alcatraz. Now, I don't know if you've seen it, but in it, it's basically a story of how Clint Eastwood uh, comes up with this slightly far-fetched plot uh, to bring three other men out of this maximum security prison um, and bring them out to safety, a prison that apparently no one had ever escaped from, yet Clint Eastwood and his ingenuity managed somehow to break through the prison walls and get out, never to be seen again. Now, this morning's passage shows us an escape that is much greater than that. You see, it's as we're reading that passage this morning, it's perhaps a story that we are quite well familiar with. The Israelites crossing the Red Sea away from the Egyptians. But I want to show us this morning that it's not just a nice story that we maybe remember from Sunday school, but it's a story that shows us much of the character of God. And we've got three points that I want to particularly point us to this morning. And the first is this. We see the mighty God who is always... In control. Now, I'm sure in the previous chapters of the book, you'll have seen how God has showed his mighty power in bringing uh, the Israelites out from Egypt, in showing his mighty hand over the uh, Egyptians by bringing the plagues. You'll have seen how he showed that he, and not Pharaoh, was the true king. So now God has brought his people out of Egypt. Although as we see, uh, just before our passage uh, from this morning, they've not gone the most direct route out of Egypt. You see, that was to avoid war with the Philistines, who were one of the neighbouring peoples. But they've gone towards the Red Sea. All the while, God has been leading them, day and night, uh, by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. And as we get to the beginning of chapter 14... We see all of this is part of God's plan. You see, verse 3, we read that God knew that Pharaoh, seeing the Israelites seemingly trapped, seemingly running around in circles, wandering, would think they were stuck. And so in verse 4, God had planned to harden Pharaoh's heart. We might come to this passage and think, well, has God only half rescued them? Is is he not completely in control that he couldn't just bring them out and that was it? No, it was all part of God's plan. And notice why it was. Verse 4, to bring glory to himself. And so after hardening Pharaoh's heart, the Egyptians pursued the Israelites. Pharaoh and his army came with 600 of the best chariots in all of Egypt, along with all of the chariots. This was certainly no half-hearted attempt to get to the Israelites. No, Pharaoh was hot on their heels. And so as we get later in the passage to verse 10, the Israelites were understandably terrified. You can imagine their fear, can't you? Seeing this great, intimidating army approaching. Whereas they were here without any weapons to defend themselves. And so verse 11, they grumble. They said to Moses, was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. They grumble. They forget that this is the God who has already supremely shown who is the king, who is in control. Do you get how ridiculous this sounds? This God has rescued them from slavery, yet they want to go back. They want to be back in captivity. Yet thankfully, this was not the end of the story for them. So we sin despite this, the mighty God is in control. And we will see now that the mighty God delivers his people. You see, despite all that grumbling, verse 13, we pick up the narrative. Moses answered to the grumbling, Do not be afraid. 
Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. The Israelites didn't need to be afraid. Only to be still. Not to be still in the sense of just doing nothing, but in the sense that they were to trust in God and in his plans and in his sovereignty. You see, the outcome was so secure, they didn't need to cry out to him. As we read later in the Bible, in Revelation chapter 7, salvation belongs to the Lord. Just as he had started their rescue from the Egyptians, so he would finish it. The outcome was secure. And it was all part of God's plan. Again, we see verse 17 and 18. To bring glory to himself when the Egyptians were defeated. And amazingly, at this point, as the army were approaching, the pillar of cloud that had been in front of them went behind him. And so what happened was, one side was darkness, one side was light. While they were in close proximity to the Egyptian army, the Israelites and the Egyptians were completely separated. And then it gets even more amazing to the part of the story perhaps most familiar with. Moses stretched out his hand to see, verse 21, and all that night, imagine it, the Lord drew back the waters, turning it into dry land. And then in verse 22, the Israelites went over the Red Sea on dry land with walls of water on either side of them. Just take a moment just to think again at the amazing display of God's power that that really is. And then the Egyptians followed them. But God threw them into confusion. You see, they had wheels of chariots flying everywhere, verse 24. And then verse 25. It's at this point the Israelites realized this was no ordinary turn of events. Read with me uh, from the second parts of verse 25. You see, they said this. Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And notice what they've noticed. The Lord there is in capitals. This is the name of the Lord that he's revealed to Moses. I am who I am. The Egyptians have seen this is the true God who is acting to bring the Israelites to safety. And just as God parted the sea, so in verse 26, uh, we're told that Moses uh, put his hand back out on God's command and the waters flowed back and the Egyptians were swept to sea. And notice in verse 28, the defeat is total. Not one of them survived. The best chariots of this mighty nation this intimidating force had been made nothing. The Lord had supremely showed once again that he was the true king, that he was the deliverer, that he would bring his people safe. And notice verse 31. When the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put the tr their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. These people had grumbled before, but now they had once again seen the amazing work of this sovereign Lord in rescuing them. It hadn't been anything they'd done, had it? They'd not done anything to deserve this rescue. They'd been grumbling. Yet God, in his purposes, in his mercy, to bring glory to himself, had delivered them completely from the Egyptians. So we've seen the mighty God who is always in control. We've seen the mighty God who delivers his people. And as we get to chapter 15, we also see the mighty God who deserves all the glory. After that amazing delivery from the Egyptians, Moses and the Israelites were understandably jubilant. They were free. They had been rescued. And when you have a victory, I don't know about you, but 
we often want to celebrate. Hopefully we'll be doing that on Tuesday night. But <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. And it's out of that jubilation that we get this next song that covers the first part of chapter 15 that Sylvia read for us. Verse 1. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its, its rider he has hurled into the sea. You see, there could be no doubt that it was the Lord who had delivered them from the Egyptians. And so it must be the Lord that is highly exalted. He must have the praise. No one else. Verse 6. Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. This was the Lord who defeated all who opposed him. This army that outwardly looked very powerful had been made nothing, had been defeated. And notice verse 9 and 10. They'd boasted, hadn't they? I will pursue, I will overtake them, I will divide the spoils. Yet what had God done? He'd simply blown them out, blowing a breath, and they'd sank like lead in the mighty waters. What an amazing God. And it causes Moses and the Israelites to ask in verse 11, Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? This is the Lord who would deliver and continue to lead his people and would reign forever, verse 18. Verse 13, this is the God who guides his people to his holy dwelling. He would go live with them then and forever. He would bring his people home. And this is the same God, wonderfully, that we worship today. And yet as we come across passages like this, seeing God's amazing display of power, there can sometimes, I guess, be a little bit of a disconnect, can't there? Perhaps we, we know this story well. We're always amazed as we come to it just to see once again what God was able to do in rescuing his people. Yet perhaps we think to our own lives and perhaps we think, well, perhaps I've not quite seen the same display of God's power. Yet the wonderful truth as we're standing here this morning is that we live the right side of the most public display of God's power there has ever been. Colossians 2, you don't need to turn there, but it says this. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having counseled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them at the cross. You see, by ourselves, we might not see God's mighty rescuing power. We are dead in our sins, as this passage there is telling us. But we've been made alive with Christ. You see, he's rescued us in the most dramatic way from our captivity, not to the Egyptians, but to sin and death. Something that by ourselves, we are powerless to defeat. And it's through the cross, isn't it, and resurrection, we see God's rescuing power supremely. Jesus, who was nailed to the cross, died there to defeat sin once for all. And then showed his power by rising over death three days later. And through that cross, that death and resurrection, Jesus disarmed all the powers and authorities. All those powers in the world that might seem stronger than God, that might seem more powerful. He made a public spectacle of them once and for all. Just as God did in defeating the Egyptians, but on an even greater scale. You see, while the story of the Exodus shows the great physical battle, the New Testament shows us that God has won the spiritual battle over sin and death for us. When life perhaps feels out of control, 
when you can feel the problems bearing down on you, when that close family relative dies or when you lose your job or when the relationships around you start to break down and we don't know how to fix them. When we get that call from the doctor that it's not a good one. When life just feels too hard to handle, we can be sure that God is with us. He is in control. Now, as we've already seen, the Israelites were fairly fickle, weren't they? They'd already seen God's power in bringing the plagues and bringing them out of Egypt. Yet they moaned and they would continue to grumble for another 40 years in the wilderness. And when our battles seem bigger than God, we can face those same temptations, can't we? Yet the amazing truth, as we can see here, is that God is more powerful, incomparably so, to any of those powers, those things around us that seem too big for us to handle, the things that perhaps make us feel powerless. So trust in him. Trust in his goodness. Trust in his saving power on the cross and his power to equip us now to face everything we might face and give him the glory for it. Just as the Egyptians did, uh, the Israelites did as they were rescued. See, if we're trusting Jesus this morning, he has made war with sin and death on our behalf. And he has won the victory supremely, showing his power. The public spectacle of the Egyptians is a picture that points us to this even greater battle won. And so let's keep reminding ourselves of these truths when life gets tough. As the Israelites were in song. Let's turn to God, the one who's supremely in control, who's mightier than any power, and who is leading us home. And as we should see that, as we see more and more of this amazing and awesome God, let us praise him all the more for his saving power. Let's pray. Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? Thank you, Lord, for the cross in which you have supremely showed your power, where you have made a public spectacle of all your enemies. Thank you that you have brought us from sin and death to life, that you have rescued us. And Lord, when we face things that maybe seem bigger than you, Lord, give us a right perspective that sees you in control, bigger and better than anything. Lord, cause us to trust you, cause us to worship you, And cause us to remember that great truth that you will reign forever and ever. Amen.